I'm Adam, and this is our son, Barry. Welcome to worship on the first Sunday of the Lenten season. Uh, thank you, Adoricios and young Barry. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks. One of our babies that were born during COVID, I have not gotten to meet them yet. So, oh, it's so good to see you. Uh, welcome to worship, brothers and sisters, as we gather on what is a beautiful winter day here in Northwest Vermont. Uh, my name is Mitchell Hay, and it is my good pleasure to serve the Essex Center United Methodist Church as the uh, equipping pastor of all the people who do pastoring in our little community of faith. And I'm one of those people. I'm Barb Lemmel, married to Mitch, also attended Essex Center. It's good to be with you all this morning. We are beginning the season of Lent. Uh, Lent is, uh, has been rediscovered by, by Protestants in the last half century or so. Uh, and I think we're uh, also beginning to, to deepen in what it means, where we're not just about, uh, here's a season of, of giving up chocolate for 40 days, but, but really taking a time for, for diving deep into the reality of who we are whose we are and how it is we're called to live as God's people. And those will be the themes that we wrestle with today. Uh, so I invite you, if you have your bulletin, which was uh, downloaded uh, or sent to you via email and is also on our Facebook pages, uh, I invite you to join us in a call to worship for Lent. Uh, we have a, 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 a new a liturgical resource that we're using for Lent uh, called A Sanctified Art, and much of our liturgy today will be coming from them, including this call to worship. God meets us in the night. Before the sun rises. Before the wound heals. Before there are answers. Before there is closure. God meets us in the light. Where joy is effervescent, where laughter is contagious, where flowers bloom from cracks in the sidewalk, not quite yet, and where people gather around the table. God meets us at the threshold, at the edge of the water, at the beginning of the wilderness at the start of something new on the edge of faith. And if God meets us in all those places, then surely God meets us in between. Staying with us through the wilderness. We are not alone. God is all around. Let us, Let us worship, worship the, the God, God of, of the, the here and, and now. And as we worship together on this first Sunday of Lent, uh, we call you and us <clears throat> to a time of confession. Um, God meets us where we are, and God's love knows no bounds. And that is true when we are our best selves. And it is also true when we have not been or are not being our best selves. And so we always ask for the reminder of God's grace and the chance to turn around to repent again. And so join us in this responsive prayer of confession. God who meets us where we are, there is nowhere we can go where you are not. You were with Jesus at his baptism. You were with him in the wilderness. And even in between, you were there saying aloud, you are my beloved. We know that you are with us too in the good, the bad, and everything in between. But so often we act like we are alone. Instead of coming to you with our hurt, we hold it in or, or cast it onto others. Instead of coming to you with our joy, 
we credit ourselves and offer you nothing. How can we say we want a deeper relationship with you while living like you are nowhere to be found? Forgive us our self-centered ways. Remind us that in every breath, in every step, you are there. You are the God who meets us where we are. Before and behind, above and below, within and around. Amen. Family of faith, body of Christ scattered in many places. If you hear nothing else today, hear this. God is here. God sees you. God knows you. God meets you at the edge of every new beginning. And God calls you beloved. We are washed by the water. We are called beloved. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Amen. Amen. We have a delightful uh, Sunday school lesson for you all uh, from Danielle and her family talking about uh, getting prepared for Lent. So uh, we welcome you to worship and we welcome them to uh, teach us a little bit about the season. All right, so I packed a bag here and I want you to look at all the things I packed. A hat. A hat. told me we were going on a hike. Am I prepared? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. No. So. You need band-aids. Oh, that's true. I should have packed some band-aids. You need some clothes to put on your body. Well, yes, I'm not going to. I'm going to wear clothes on my body. Yep. But maybe an extra layer in case uh, it gets cold. Are you talking about the things you'll pack? Yeah, the things we pack. Yeah. Maybe yep. you should get like an extra pair of pants in case they Maybe. Get yep. But am I, am, am I prepared to go hiking? Or some yes. yes. What if when we got in the car, the person said, actually, we're going to go to Alaska. What? Am I ready for Alaska? No. 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 Well, what things would I pack that's different? You might want to put the extra pair. What would I clothes. pack that was different? Clothes. Clothes. Yeah, clothes. warm things. Yep. What if they said, oh, actually, we're going to a desert? Mm -hmm. Um, Short sleeve stuff. Short sleeves. Maybe some sunscreen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What if I was headed on a boat? Uh, food. Food. Um, Pills that make sure you don't get seasick. Yeah, and pills that don't get seasick. Money. What about a life jacket? bathing suit, more sunscreen. So, is if I have a bag, does that mean I'm prepared for everything? No. No. Sometimes we think we're ready, but we get caught off guard. We're not quite prepared. Today, the reading was about how Jesus prepared for his work on earth. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, Jesus knew that his life from now on might be a little bit hard. Yep. Things were going to be a little challenging. Yep. Yep. So Jesus spent time. Do you remember where the Bible said Jesus is spending time? Mm -hmm. In the desert. In the desert, in the wilderness. Yep, and there it was a desert. He didn't bring anything with him. Nothing. Nothing. He didn't bring sunscreen. He didn't bring he food. Clothes, he didn't bring though. water. He didn't bring anything with him. He trusted that God to provide for him. He had clothes on his body. Yes, so. he did have clothes on his body. Yep. Um, he trusted God and didn't want to be distracted as he prepared. He didn't want to bring an iPad with him, so that would be distracted. He wanted to spend that time with God. God. Yes. Pray. As he got ready for his time teaching, it was mm -hmm. his time to spread the good word. And then what was going to happen at the end of Jesus' life? He was going to um, forgive, thank God for him. Mm -hmm. And how does he die? Um, they put him on the cross. Right, does that sound like an easy thing that he knows is going to happen in three years? No. No, so there was a lot of things that were going to happen and he had to get his heart ready and spend some time with God. So, does anyone know, on Wednesday, the season before Easter started, 
Does mm -hmm. anyone know what that season is called? Ash Wednesday Lent. Lent, yep. Lent, like what's in your belly button or what's in between your toes? No. Oh, <laughs> not Lent, Lent. So Lent is a time that we remember Jesus' life and we serve God. We focus on the things that Jesus did on earth. He, because he's the perfect example of how God wants us to be, how to serve others. So during this time, do you know anyone that kind of gives some, we do some different things. We honor Lent by doing something different. So some people give things up that they enjoy. Hmm. Do you know anyone that does that? Oh, Nana. Nana, I do sometimes. Nana gave up candy. Nana gave up candy. <laughs> so some people give up yeah, candy or treats. Yep, Papa does it too. Some people give up TV. Some people give up screen time. Some people give things, um, add things to their life. So they add like, some quiet time, or they add prayer, or they serve others. They start doing something new. They go to a food shelf and help mm. stock shelves. This is to prepare their hearts and minds as they get ready for Lent. Yep. Spending time with God is a way to prepare. Yep. Just like Jesus prepared for the years that were coming up. Mm -hmm. So we never know what's coming next. Did we think COVID was going to come and cancel a lot of things? No. No. Do you, you never know what's going to happen in your life. Bad things could happen, good things could happen, you could move to a new exciting place. But can you always be prepared for what's going to happen? No. no, you can't always have the right things in your backpack. But if your heart is prepared, you always know that God is with you. Yep. If you've spent time, even though your stuff isn't prepared, your heart is prepared. Yep. Yep. All right, can we say a prayer? Mm hmm Dear God, we know that we can't always have what we need in our backpacks. We never know what's coming next. But we know that when we spend time with you, remembering Jesus' life, taking time things away so that we can concentrate more on you or adding things, it helps us to prepare our hearts. And when our hearts are prepared, even when things get hard, we know that you're with us. Amen. Amen. Goodbye. Thank you, Danielle and family. Uh, that was wonderful. Having been to Alaska, I can relate to that. Uh, we were not prepared. <laughs> well, we were as prepared as we could be. Right? Um, <clears throat> so the traditional reading for the first Sunday of Lent is the story of Jesus um, being baptized and going out into the wilderness. And because we're in the Gospel of Mark, it's very short. Uh, Mark is in a hurry to get on to Jesus' ministry. And so he tells a very stripped down version of this story. And so hear these words from Mark's gospel. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. So ends this reading. <clears throat> Last week, uh, several of us who are on the Board of Ordained Ministry were asked to uh, write uh, prayers for uh, for our COVID. They, they have a daily COVID poem or prayer, and uh, we were asked to, to do that. So I did some reflecting on, on this reading last week, um, and it had me thinking back to a, a time of crisis in in my own faith life back in in high school and uh this is what i wrote i don't know if it's a prayer or a poem or somewhere in between hey god remember when i was 17 and contemplating bailing out on my parents church and maybe bailing out on you in all my teenage sophistication and how my parents bought me my very own brand spanking new 
NIV Ryrie study Bible with the genuine bonded leather burgundy cover and my name embossed in gold. Do you remember how I decided one day to read the opening chapter of Mark's breathless gospel? Really reading the words for myself for the first time. And for the first time, I found myself wondering why Mark insisted that the heavens were torn apart and not just opened. I found myself yearning to hear your tender words to Jesus for myself. You are my child, mm -hmm. the beloved. I found myself smiling wryly at the thought of a long-haired, sandaled Nazarene being driven into the wilderness, my mind's eye picturing a laughing spirit gripping the wheel of a speeding Jeep CJ5 with the radio turned up and the top stowed down and the still wet from baptism Jesus hanging on for dear life as they bolt out into the desert for mutual adventure. Do you remember? I remember. Much later now, I remember, and I'm so grateful for my own 40 days, 40 weeks, 40 years, in so many wildernesses since then, and the syncopated rhythm of temptations and rest and resilience and silence and friends and solitude and the terrifying assurance of your wild, unleashed presence undergirding all of it. I, I, maybe we don't have to say anything else. <laughs> I, I guess for That's me, wonderful. my wilderness, whether they're, they're 40 minutes or 40 hours or 40 years, uh, they're about spiritual transformation. They're about personal transformation, which I think ultimately is about discovering in my core who and whose I am. Uh, there's a, a sister, Joan Soro, wrote that we can enter the inner terrain and find the presence of God amid the layers. Mm -hmm. Go to the place called barren, she writes. Stand in the place called empty, and you will find God there. And I think that means that I will also find my most authentic self there. And that invitation to the place called empty comes in all kinds of ways, mm -hmm. right? So um, in an entirely different way, it makes me think of uh, when I was first doing spiritual director training. And I didn't really, I didn't really know what spiritual director training was, but it sounded like a good thing to take. And I thought, mm -hmm. you know, I'd, I'll learn listening techniques and prayer techniques and I don't know what all. And it was about the second day of this mm -hmm. four day retreat. And all of a sudden I realized that when our teacher, Wendy Miller kept saying, kept asking us about what was our rule of life? What was our spiritual practice and, and asking us to do Lexio Divina with her 
And I suddenly thought, I just got it like a thunderclap. Oh my gosh, she's interested in doing my spiritual formation, mm. right? So this isn't about me learning to help other people with their spiritual formation. I mean, that's part of it. But the very beginning of it is that I need to work on who I am so that when I am doing spiritual direction with folks, I come out of a deep well that I've formed in myself. And so part of the spiritual director training was, was inviting us into that place called empty, mm -hmm. that place where we would be spiritually formed so that we could with authenticity invite others to do the same. Right. You can't offer anyone <clears throat> anything that you haven't experienced. Yeah, that's I think or that's almost least, always yeah. true. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right. And or, or if it happens, it's because God's doing it through me somehow. It's mm -hmm. not because I can do it. Right. But you, you've got to get your own stuff worked on. Exactly. And I think that's part of what's happening in our very brief, uh, breathless reading from Mark today. Uh, Jesus, too, goes to the place called empty, mm -hmm. to the wilderness, to the desert, to ask the big questions. Who am I? Uh, mm -hmm. What is the path I take as the beloved one? Uh, how do I look at the path before me and say, not this, not this, not this? And what is it that finally allows me to say this? Mm. This is the path. Right. So, so Jesus, again, goes into the wilderness to discover who and whose he is. Now, that, that, that's the comfort part. Right? We, we've talked for a couple of weeks now about, about words of comfort and words of challenge mm -hmm. and, and discovering who he is as the beloved <clears throat> Uh, is uh, is that comfort part. And that's, but that's only part of it. So yes, part of it, I think, is half. discovering who and whose he is. And also in that place called empty, being open to being transformed mm -hmm. into who it is that God calls us to be. Yeah. So absolutely getting clear about ourselves and then also opening up and saying to God, okay, do what you will. <laughs> Right, I trust you. Mm -hmm. um, and he came. He was he was driven out into the wilderness right after he heard God say, "You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased." Yeah. And those are absolutely words of of comfort. But I also feel like that "You are my beloved" is also an invitation to a challenge. Because if I am your beloved, I imagine Jesus saying. So how, do, how am I to live? What does that mean? What, what kind of ministry, what kind of calling do I have for my life? And I believe that all of us have ministries, all of us have callings. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so understanding that we are beloved and then saying, and now how do I live? That's what Lent is about. Mm. I think that's uh, why, why Mark, uh, uses the Holy Spirit uh, both to show that belovedness. Jesus sees the Holy Spirit come down from heaven like a dove, uh, about as comforting an image as there, there is. And yet it's also the Holy Spirit that drives Jesus out into the wilderness. In a Jeep. Uh, in a Jeep CJ5. <laughs> uh, not to do too many Greek lessons, but the, the, the Greek word that, that sometimes gets uh, translated as driven or, or hurled, uh, right. we had in, in one translation, uh, is, is the Greek word for, for throwing a spear. Uh, Jesus got chucked <laughs> into the wilderness. Right, uh, right, right. It's, it's, uh, it's not a comforting word. So it's not just all. sitting in your belovedness. Right? No, you or, don't stay there. So Richard Rohr summarized it well when he said that spirituality isn't waiting for something to happen. Mm. It's choosing to live in a certain way. Right. And it feels to me like that's what Lent is, is mm -hmm. what way do we choose to live knowing that we are God's beloved? And in the wilderness, Jesus had to make choices about how he would mm -hmm. live, how he would do his future ministry. Luke and Matthew give a lot more details about bread and stones and cool stuff in, in their depictions. But Mark's bare bones version just says, boom, tempted right. by the accuser. Um, right. And so we have to do a lot of interpreting uh, right. for ourselves. Uh, I read an amazing article this mm -hmm. week. 
uh, in not the deepest source on the planet, Huffington Post, uh, but it was a, a it, it was it was entitled as you would expect in in, in Huffington Post. I rather breathlessly. Uh, I tracked down the girls who bullied me as a kid. Here's what they had to say. Uh, clickbait. Clickbait. Yeah, <laughs> it didn't say with this one weird trick. Thankfully, but uh, you could. You, just, kind of. But the author was named uh, Simone Ellen, and uh, and she is a person who's been struggling for years with uh, with uh, uh, issues of, of uh, self worth, self uh, self image. Uh, a lot of depression, and while she didn't blame it all on her awful experiences in, in high school, um, it was it was a big part of it. Uh, at, at at a young age in middle school, being told you don't belong, you're not you're not okay as you are. You are not beloved. You are on the outside. Being told that by other girls. Being told that by by other girls. This is Westchester County, New York, yeah. which probably has a whole special way of doing that. Some of us can relate. So she did this little experiment, uh, being that it's a lot easier to do nowadays with with social media. She uh, she was able to uh, get contacts for uh, over thirty people, thirty girls, uh, former girls, now women who uh, who had bullied her. Uh, well, and it was some who had bullied her, but it was also just some other girls. Some, she yes, decided like, she would get in touch with as many girls from her junior high years as she could. And uh, it was it was a fascinating read uh, and kind of an interesting psychology experiment. Uh, uh, she, she talked to kind of the girl who was the, the chief instigator uh, about and and people were willing to talk. Right. That's what was really interesting. So she had wanted... to push. The chief instigator didn't respond back at first, and mm -hmm. she had to ask again. And then she had a, a Facebook thing that said, do you really want to talk to me? And when she wrote back and said yes, two minutes later, the phone rang. Right. right. And she was talking with this person. And she talked a little bit about her experience being bullied by her and her, her bullier, uh, talked about how how she recognized how horrible she was to her. Um, and then she was also able to explain, not explain, but to share uh, what was going on in her life. And it was abusive and awful. Uh, and then she was able to say, I'm so sorry I took it out on you. And Simone wrote, hearing it from her own lips, made all the difference. I was finally able to forgive her and I hope to help her to forgive herself. So what Simone did was she walked into the wilderness, right? She, yeah, she, she leaned was. into that discomfort of contacting folks who had been mm -hmm. cruel to her yeah. Um, yeah. and other folks as well. And, and she invited them into, into their wilderness. Yes. Yeah. So she went into that wilderness and then because she did that, she could be healed some mm -hmm. and they could be healed some. And she was able to recognize that her bullies, her tormentors were not, were not demons. Right. They, they, they were, were not beasts. Yeah. They, were hurt uh, kids. they, they were fellow broken people. They, they were hurt people. And we've said this before in sermons, hurt people hurt people. Yeah. And she was able to recognize them. Uh, one woman she, she talked with uh, shared a story about being part of a group that excluded a classmate in seventh grade. And I'll, I'll read the quote here. I was culpable we call that confession. Right. I was culpable. And I think I immediately and forever thought that was my personal weakness. It was cruel. I still feel guilty all these years later. Subsequently, and this is what the, that woman called the excluded group member to apologize for hurting her. And she later told me that that interaction brought great relief to both of them. 
So that invitation into the wilderness uh, allowed healing not only for herself, but created ripples of compassion mm -hmm. uh, to be able to uh, go far beyond her immediate, mm -hmm. her immediate place. And one of the things I really loved about the story was not only the way that Simone opened up the possibilities of healing that started to ripple out, mm -hmm. Um, also, as she spoke with, with the, the women who'd been her tormentors and then other women too, she started to reflect on her own high school experience and where she had been feeling herself as just the victim, mm -hmm. she realized that actually the truth was a little more nuanced than that. And so, yes, she had been the victim of some of that torment. She'd also done a fair amount of tormenting mm -hmm. or I don't know about a fair yeah. amount, but some, right? I mean, just mm -hmm. being middle school kids. Um, and so she realized that, yeah, I gossiped and I shunned classmates who weren't cool and, and I worried about my social status. And so she too started to piece to, so to heal not only what she felt had been done to her, but also to put herself back together as a more whole person. So mm -hmm. it was not only just leaning into the discomfort of what others had done, but journeying into her own discomfort of who she was and choosing to be different as she moved forward. In Mark's very brief telling of the wilderness experience, he says that Jesus was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what Ms. Ellen's article uh, showed me is that, is that sometimes there is no difference between the angels and the wild beasts it's uh, perspective. or or even confronting her demons it was the word that that that, that she used uh, it's how we view and connect with them and transform them and, uh, us. and ourselves yes uh jung uh talked about how how uh Psychological and spiritual wholeness comes not 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 just from being an angel, but 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 from recognizing and confronting our, our shadow side uh, right. to confront that which is uh, and heal that which is not whole. Um, so that, yeah. that that requires going into the wilderness. That's not just uh, Hallmark right. cards. And so so that's to us. This is what Lent's about. And so. Um, you know, I'm curious about what is it that drives us? What is it that drives you into the wilderness? Um, or what is it that woos you or mm. woos us into the wilderness? There have definitely been times in my life where I've felt hurled into wilderness. Um, there also have been times when it's been more of an invitation, kind of a, hey, this isn't going to be easy, but come and check this out because it will have been worth it in the long run. And um, I was reflecting this week that um, these 40 days of Lent, which sometimes get um, made into, you know, the 40 days that we get all clean and shiny for Easter. We try to mm. scrub all of the sin out of ourselves, like uh, New Year's resolutions 2.0, right? One, one more self-help project. Right. That um, the invitation in Lent is to go out into the wilderness and it is not clean and shiny out there, right? There's a reason we start with ashes. On Ash Wednesday. It's dirty. It's gritty. Um, and it's about how do we lean into that discomfort? So we found ourselves reflecting on the work and the words of Parker Palmer, who's a Quaker leader. He's um, the founder of the Center for um, Courage and Renewal. I was going to say Action and Contemplation, nope. but that's Richard Rohr. Different guy. <laughs> the Center for Courage and Renewal. Um, he was the, he ran Pendle Hill which is a Quaker retreat center for years and years. He's just an incredibly deep thinker and spiritual being. And if there's anyone who I think strives every day to live out the fullness of his belovedness in service to others, it's Parker Palmer. And so it was really interesting. It's interesting to me that he has struggled mightily at certain times in his life about mm -hmm. th through times of depression. And um, I heard an interview with him recently where he, he confessed that sometimes the problems in the world seem so big that 
it sort of paralyzes him. It's like, what, what can I even do about any of this, right? Which I can relate to, right? Mm -hmm. And then he told this story of a friend of his named Greg Ellison. So his friend Greg said, my grandmother, so this is yeah. Greg's grandmother, related to Parker, to us, to you, right? Greg's grandmother taught him that he can't change the whole world, but he can change what's within three feet or so of him. And uh, what Greg has done is sometimes he does workshops where he hands people yardsticks and says, okay, three feet within you, you can change that space. Or um, if you're a seamstress as I am, you know that from your nose to the end of your finger, when you reach mm -hmm. your arm out here, I'll do it this way so it's in the screen. Yeah. This is about a yard, right? So that's about three feet. So basically anything you can get your arms around, mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. a three feet area. And Greg says, either literally or in your imagination, what is it that you might be able to, to affect that's within three feet of you? What can you make better for God? Where can you offer healing in these places? And Parker Palmer said, once in a while, at the end of the day, he thinks to himself, I hit the three foot mark today. And then he can rest. I didn't fix all the problems in the world, but I fixed something that was within three feet of me. Now that interview was pre-COVID, right? And when I was hearing yes. it on on Krista Tippett's show, my first thought was, "Well, that's not going to work anymore because we have to be six feet away from everybody, <laughs> right. right?" So that was everyone's twice as far, and so we can't we can't affect anything anymore. Though in Zoom, right? Right. So so I mean, you all are more than three feet away from us, and yet in a way, you're within three feet of us, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll sit closer close, to the screen. Yeah, we'll sit a little closer to the screen. There's ways that we can, we, our worlds, in some ways our worlds have shrunk. And then in other ways, I think it's made us more aware of how we do have an influence over the phone, through email, with letters, uh, shouting from back porch to back porch, right? Uh, Simone Ellen certainly found that to be the case, that her time on the phone. Right. Uh, as she was only worried about changing herself, uh, found that she yes. was changed, the, the, the ripples of that went, went beyond her three foot lens. Yeah. Uh, when those, those ripples went, went beyond and changed, changed lives much further away. Uh, there, this week, uh, all sorts of news articles uh, about uh, the guy whose nickname, his, his name's Jim, but, but, but they call him Mattress Mike, Meckingvale? I don't know. Meckingvale. I don't pronounce it correctly. But he's called Mattress Mike. He's named Matt Mattress Mike because the way mo most people see him is when he's advertising out front of his furniture store, he's wearing a mattress uh, with his little with head sticking out and come in and buy my stuff. Well, he's got uh, three stores in Texas. That, in Houston. In, in, in the Houston area. Uh, big honking old uh, furniture stores. And he made news for once again, opening up his furniture store uh, to victims of the uh, Texas weather anomaly uh, going on there right now. He, he did this for three hurricanes mm -hmm. and now he's doing it for uh, the Texas winter disaster. He opens up his store and people masked uh, come in and can sleep on his beds and can eat on his dining room tables. He- They watch he, TV on his watch, big, big, on his screen, big TVs. screen TVs. He paid for uh, food trucks to come right. and feed the folks, uh, whether it's breakfast burritos to pizza. Uh, yeah. He, he writes this. It's not our privilege to do this. It is not our right to do this. It's our obligation. This is what we were put on the earth to do is help other people. It's right. real basic. Uh, and I don't think any of the news stories, at least none of the ones that I noticed, talked about whether he's a person of faith, whether he goes to church. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, He's someone who seems to know that he is God's beloved. I don't know if he would use those words. Mm -hmm. And he's determined to use his belovedness to help out other folks who are in need, right? So if they're cold, mm -hmm. 
come on in, come on. sleep on my beds. And in, it's because he's recognizing the belovedness in others. Right. That they are all, they are all children of God and they are all beloved children of God. And so come in, get warm, be fed, find a little dignity in the midst of the indignity that comes from this weather event and the bad planning <clears throat> that wasn't there beforehand. So that was his three feet, right? That was his, his, his three, three feet, feet. was actually three furniture stores, right. right? But that was where he had a sphere of influence and could use that to, to help other folks out, to change other people's lives. And, and you get a sense of joy in him as well as he does this. And so our invitation for land, for you, for us, is how, how might we move into our wildernesses, mm -hmm. open to God transforming us so that we can work on transforming the three feet around us, um, literally or figuratively. And what that does is transform a three foot wilderness into a three foot portion of a beloved community, yes. a three foot portion of what Jesus called the kingdom or kingdom or realm of God, a place where all can discover their belovedness, the innate dignity of being a child of God. And this, I believe, is how God heals the world mm -hmm. through one person at a time. One, one three foot section at a time. If you're listening in Canada, that would be one meter. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and so, so that's, our, that's our prayer for ourselves and for you in this Lent season. May it be so. May it be so. But that brings us to an advertisement. Indeed. One of the tools that we uh, would like to share uh, during Lent for helping us uh, discover our own belovedness and open ourselves to the transformation that God offers in the midst of our wilderness experiences are uh, uh, a couple of resources that if you are part of one of our shepherd groups, uh, you will be receiving this uh, in the mail or in person from, from your yeah, shepherd. Hold them, up. Oh, hold them up. We'll be Vanna. Uh, the first is a collection of what are called daily devotional cards. And these are wonderful around the table at dinner time. Inside each one, uh, and this was hundreds of hours of slicing paper. Uh, there will be a a topic. Here is Selah, which is a Hebrew word for we think for rest or to stop. Uh, and when you turn it over, there is this is backwards for me. I'm sorry. Just hold it up to the, to the light. Oh, okay. There's a reflection, reflection questions, and a prayer. And I think there are 48 of these, one for each uh, day of Lent and, and, and Sundays during Lent. Uh, I would invite you each day to take a look at one of the cards and, and do the reading and think about some of the reflection questions and the prayer. And again, this is great at dinner if you're a family. Uh, uh, or a couple to uh, to do this around the dinner table. Uh, and if you're not a family or a couple, we invite you if you want to find another person that you'll talk to about it on the phone or by email or over Facebook or whatever. If and you're one of the part of a shepherd group, that can be a, a discussion. You guys can agree on what card to look at uh, each day. Uh, and if you're not part of a shepherd group, I'll be doing a card a day on our Facebook page as well. So uh, to offer that up and uh, people can put some observations down there. And then there's also a devotion book that each week has uh, scripture readings, a poem, some art. Um, again, just another way for you to engage um, your journey of Lent. You don't have to do all of this. Some of it may speak to you, some of it may not. Um, but in, in all of this together, plus what you're putting on the Facebook page, um, our hope is that there will be something in there that sparks your own journey. Thanks. And they're, they're for visual folks, there's artwork to, to look at yeah. and scripture readings and other stuff. The themes in this devotional book uh, are, are broad, but the overall theme is God again and again 
is, is here for us. And this first week is again and again, we're invited in. We are invited by God uh, into this Lenten journey. And Craig and Heidi Evans uh, are going to share uh, a short video about uh, how they felt invited in coming, uh, being connected to our little faith community. So Craig and Heidi, share with us. Good morning, Essex United Methodist Centre friends. We are Craig and Heidi Evans, and Mitch has asked us to talk about what is an invitation. If you were to look at my mailbox on any day, you would find numerous invitations to apply for a new credit card or to sign up for personalised coupons. All of this is aptly named junk, colourless and actually totally impersonal. On my kitchen bulletin board, you will find a personalised invitation to Charlotte's May 2020 UVM Honours College graduation. An opportunity to get dressed up and to be proud parents. And yet, like many 2020 events, cancelled and forgotten. We arrived in Vermont in the fall of 2008 with a second and a fifth grader. Having been active members of our previous Episcopal Church in Wisconsin, we naturally checked out the Episcopal Churches first. Our search eventually led us to the Little White Methodist Church on Route 15. The first Sunday was a Mitch and Barb skit. Mitch was lying at the back of the church in some kind of costume. Interesting. We had many welcomes. June Packard invited Charlotte to join the Golda kids in the Sunday school. We left with a general sense that we should give this church a second interview. Why did we return to this little church and not one of the others? Partly because of the low key, come as you are feeling. The sense of genuine warmth to our family and the fact that ideas and concerns are discussed openly. Here was a personal invitation to join the journey with fellow members, but moving at our pace and not theirs. The openness to change and adapt is a challenge and a quality that we are learning to embrace. The invitation is still there, though in the, the last 12 months have been a challenge. Many of the little things are missing. Our singing badly out of tune, but with Dana and Catherine holding it all together, the passing of the peace, the adorably chaotic young people's message, Mitch mislaying parts of his sermon. Despite these, challenge, these challenges, what binds us together is the continuing invitation to be on this journey together as a community. Mm. Thank you, Heidi and Craig. Oh, we're going to prepare ourselves for a time of prayer. Uh, and we're going to do that with uh, with some music. Uh, and uh, we invite you to, uh, during the musical interlude, uh, to write down any prayer concerns you might have in the comments section on the Facebook page. Uh, today, the uh, photos are not by our august organist. You wanted you to know that, but the playing certainly is. So uh, do enjoy. Can, uh, Catherine's music. It's called Via Dolorosa.
Thank you, Catherine. What a beautiful array of birds and music this morning uh, for all of our hearts. I actually heard some bird song this morning. Um, I think they were happy that the sun is out as well. <clears throat> as we come together in prayer, I'm going to share a prayer with you that's written by Jan Richardson for this season of Lent. And so let's join our spirits together in prayer. God, I am not asking you to take this wilderness from me, to remove this place of starkness where I come to know the wilderness within me, where I learn to call the names of the ravenous beasts that pace inside me, to finger the brambles that snake through my veins, to taste the thirst that tugs at my tongue. But send me tough angels, sweet wine, strong bread, just enough. Mm. Man. Just enough. We bring prayers from friends in the community. Allison, we pray with Allison a prayer for R, that he may find the healing he seeks. With Dana, we pray for her new preemie nephew, Meyer. He needs hernia surgery, but has a heart murmur and isn't able to have a surgery yet. He will be okay, but prayers that he keeps growing stronger every day and prayers to ease my sister's anxiety. Mm. With Nancy, prayers for the families of Glade Taylor and George McDonald. Both of them passed away last week. Glade was mm. one of my former students a classmate of Chloe's and Micah's. Mm -hmm. And George was a close friend from my high school years. Catherine asks for prayers for, oh, prayers and hugs she offers up to Danielle. I'm sorry, or to Dana. To Dana, thank you. I think that's all the prayers that got lifted up this morning. And lots of uh, thanks to Craig and Heidi for their sharing uh, and how that echoes many folks' experience of welcome at this, mm -hmm. at this little community of faith. And you and I felt that as well when we came 14 years ago. And so lifting up those concerns and lifting up these gratitudes, the gratitude for this place. God, we also lift up to you the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our, our daily bread, bread and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive those who trespass, who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, as always, we have uh, announcements to share. And I did I not think you printed print out. out the bulletin. And so I'm sorry, but on the back of our uh, bulletin, uh, which is online and I can't see it right now. Uh, we have birthdays uh, this week uh, for announcements. There's going to be a Bible study on Monday night at seven o'clock and the Zoom address uh, is listed there. We are continuing with our Bible project and looking at some of the aspects of God's nature. Uh, also, uh, each Sunday evening during Lent, uh, there will be an anti-racism uh, workshop that is available and that address is on there as well. That's through the conference. Thank I believe you. that it, the annual conference is um, offering the anti-racism workshop. And Jeremy uh, 
in an amazing, uh, amazing bit of technological magic, got the birthday list up here already. Uh, Bob McLean is having a birthday on the 24th. Molly Duff on the 26th. Mark Kleindenst on the 27th. And Mary Drury and Alyssa Johnson on the 28th. So uh, happy birthday to all of them. It's exciting. We'll send you out with a benediction for Lent. We'll use the same uh, benediction by Sarah R. Uh, each week during Lent. Mm. And it goes like this. As you leave this space, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk toward justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day. In the name of the lover, the beloved and love itself, Go with courage, go with heart, go in peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace into this journey of Lent. Find your three-foot wilderness, and with God at your center, may it be transformed into a three-foot kingdom of God. Amen. Amen.